Hello, welcome to week five, unit five, combining functions. To make the code you write more compact, it's quite common to nest functions. In this unit, we will have a detailed look what nesting actually means. We already used nesting quite a lot. If you remember this small code snippet on the slide, where we, for example, ask the user for input and then convert the input to an integer, that's something we already used throughout this course quite often. And this is actually already nesting function. So what happens when this code is evaluated? First, the input function is called. We get an input from the user. The user input is returned and is given as an input parameter to the integer conversion function. And this function converts the user input to an integer. So let's have a look in more detail at nesting functions. It's showtime again. We will switch over to our Jupyter Notebooks and see nesting in more detail there. So here we are in the Jupyter Notebook. And as you can see, I have this small example, which we already used quite a few times. And this example nests two functions, namely the input conversion and the input to ask a user for a number and convert it to an integer number right away. So let's execute this. And what will happen if I enter 50 here? We don't see any additional output. The 50 string is converted to the number 50 and assigned to the variable number. Um, when this code is evaluated, what happens is that first the input function is called and afterwards the result of the input function is given to the int function. To make this a little bit more explicit, what we see up here is exactly the same what is done here, just the little helper variable user input was removed. So if I execute now the code snippet down here, we would see it generates the same result. So if I execute it, and a 50, the same happens. So whenever you see a construct where multiple functions are nested, you need to remember that the evaluation happens from the innermost function to the outermost function. So in this case, first the input is evaluated and afterwards the int. Of course, it's also possible to nest multiple functions. And this is exactly what is shown here in this example. What I have here is I defined a very simple function called multiply, which takes two parameters a and b and returns their product. And what I could now do is I could nest multiple functions. So we have two inputs here. We have two calls to int. We have a call to multiply and finally to print. And what happens if I execute this code? You see, I have to enter a first number, let's say 11, and a second number, let's say five, and then we get a result. The product of the two numbers is 55. And what you see in this example is that it's easily possible to nest multiple functions. In this case, actually, we have four functions that are nested. We have the int function, the input function, the multiply, and the print. And if you have a detailed look, what would happen here is that the innermost function is evaluated first. So first, this input is evaluated. We have to enter a number. This number is converted to an integer. Next, see this input is evaluated. We have to enter another number, and the result is converted to an integer. Now we have both parameters for the multiply function. So the multiply function is evaluated and the result is given to the print function, which is the last function in this whole um, execution chain that is called. What this example already shows you quite nicely is that nesting functions can be useful but it can also be misused. So if you nest too many functions, it's really hard to understand what your program does. So 
it's not easy anymore in this example to see with one look at the program what actually happens in which order the functions are executed. So nesting is possible, but sometimes it's better to introduce helper variables to make it explicit for a reader of the program in which order the different steps are executed. For the computer, it doesn't matter. It's just for the human reader trying to understand what your program does, um, that it's easier to understand. So, to sum it up, yeah, nesting, it's quite powerful, but always remember the Peter Parker principle, with great power comes great responsibility, so you should use nesting when it helps, when it fosters understanding of your program code, but not overuse it because it will hinder you to understand your program code later on yourself. Besides nesting, there is also a second way to combine functions, and this is invoking functions in that other functions. We have done this numerous times ourselves already, for example, with a print function, but I wanted to make this explicit here in this unit as well. So, if you have a look at the example, we have different functions. First, I define a function that is called is dividable, and this function checks if A is dividable by B without a remainder. So, for example, 10 can be divided by 2 without a remainder. 3 cannot be divided by 2, there will be a remainder of 1. And that's exactly what this function does. We are using the modulo operator for this. And once we have the is divisible function in place, we can use the is prime function to check if a number which we give to this function is a prime number. And how do we do this? We use a very simple, slow approach to check this, but it's just for demonstrating purposes. So we check each and every number from 2 up until n, and if the current number can divide the number that we, that we provided as a parameter, we know it's no prime number, so we return false. And if we got through this loop without ever returning false, we know in the end down here that none of the numbers between 2 and our number n can divide the number, therefore we know it's a prime number and we can return true. And now we can use this is prime function to check if different numbers, for example, 10 or 17 are prime. And you see here that we combine different functions to provide a functionality. So our is prime function reuses inside our is divisible function. Let's execute this. And of course, we get the result that 10 is no prime number, 10 can be divided by 2 and 5, but 17 is a prime number. Okay, now it's your turn again. We have an exercise here. In this exercise, you will be practicing combining and nesting functions. And what is this exercise all about? In this exercise, you should calculate the binomial coefficient. This binomial coefficient can be used to calculate how many possible combinations um, there are in the case of a lottery. For example, in Germany, we have this lottery where you uh, six numbers out of 49 numbers are drawn, and the binomial coefficient can be used to calculate what is the number of possible combinations in this lottery. For the German version of the lottery, the number of possible combinations is 49 factorial divided by 6 factorial multiplied with 49 minus 6 factorial. And that's exactly the binomial coefficient. I also provided you here with the with a mathematical formula for the binomial coefficient. And your task now is to write a function that calculates the binomial coefficient. I provided you as a starting point already a function factorial that calculates the factorial of a number. And you can now use this factorial function to implement your 
binomial function. So, as always, I would suggest you pause the video now, try to solve this exercise yourself, and I will show you a possible solution later on. So, welcome back. I will show you one possible solution for this exercise right now. So, what is our task? Our task is to implement a function binomial. Um, and what does this function take? This function needs two parameters namely the number n of objects and the number k of objects which are chosen from, from the set of n objects. So we just stick with these names that are used in the mathematical formula as well, k and n. So, and how can we now calculate this binomial coefficient? The formula we need is printed here. We need to calculate n factorial and divided by k factorial multiplied with n minus k factorial. So I will do this step by step um, so that it's easy to understand. So the first thing we need to calculate is n factorial and n factorial we can use our factorial function to do this we calculate the factorial of n. Next, we need to calculate factorial of k. So we do this. And we also need n minus k factorial. We calculate this as well, n minus k. And finally, we can now calculate the resulting binomial coefficient. Binomial coefficient, and this is n fact divided by k factorial multiplied with n minus k factorial, and so that's our result, and we can now return the binomial coefficient. So I did this in different steps so that you see how the, the functions are actually combined. Um, of course, it would have been also possible to do this without the help of variables. So. Let's give this a try. Let's see how our calculation works. Um, and what we try to calculate is the number of possible combinations for the German lottery. So we say, need a result, print. Um, the possible number of combinations to draw k. Oh, no, we're calculating in German. So that's to draw six numbers from 49 numbers is. And what we calculate here is now our binomial coefficient from 6 from 49. So, let's execute this. And here we get our result. It's a, it's a floating point number. The, we could probably also convert this to an integer to make it more readable. Yeah, let's do this. So we use some nesting as well. So the possible combinations for the German lottery are roughly 140 million different combinations. Oh no, it's 14 million. 14 million, not 114. So roughly 14 million different combinations. So this gives you a little perspective how likely it is that you win the lottery if you play lottery games.
One thing I'd like to mention here, um, there are a few common patterns that I tend to use and that are quite common in Python programs as well. And this is what is shown here by the small example. I have here an example where I defined different functions. One function is called play Ramones, one is called play music, and then there is a global variable called song. So, and what you see here is that in this function play Ramones, I assign the value Blitzkrieg Bob to the variable song, and then I call play music and provide the variable song. And play music has one parameter, which is also called song, and it leads to just printing out I'm listening to uh, and the content of the song. What happens if I execute this program? You see, I get one output, I'm listening to Blitzkrieg Bob. But what the important part here is that there are at least three different songs in this small code snippet. We have here a global variable, we have here a parameter that is called song, and we have here a local variable that's called song. And those are all different variables. They have different scope, and for a computer it doesn't really matter that all of them are called song. For us as a human reader, it's easier to follow the execution of the program. So if I try to understand what's happening here, I see, okay, play Ramones is invoked. So I look at the play Ramones function. There is a variable song. The song is passed to the play music function. And here in the play music function, song is printed. So I can assume that whatever I provide to the play music function is printed down here. However, you should always remember that these are different variables with different scope, and they are just called the same to make understanding easily for the human reader. So the names are just hints, uh, and they could well be wrong, um, but it's a common pattern you see in lots of Python code, and therefore I wanted to mention it. You always have to keep in mind, this song is something different than this song, and is something different than this song. Let's jump back to our slides. What have we learned in this unit? In this unit, you have learned how to combine functions using nesting, or how to combine functions by invoking one function inside another function. And I've also mentioned as a caveat that combining functions might become complex to understand, so therefore you should use it wisely. Thanks for watching and hope to see you again in one of the upcoming units.